I understand this thing about generational wealth, generational properties. I know that through the years, we did not have the opportunities to uh, get real estate. It was not available to us. Even today, even what's happening right now with this trying to grab our land, you see, this has happened to a lot of people, and it's happened through all the years. And that is the reason that so many black people um, suffer now in poverty. My mother, Betty Porter's three times grandmother, Perwella Coley, was a free woman of color in um, the 1820s in North Carolina. She was given 350 acres of land in Havelock, North Carolina, for which my two times great grandfather, um, William H. Coley Jr., inherited along with his siblings. Later, it was passed down to the next generation. However, the U.S. government took their property, th property through eminent domain, which included many black families who had lived on the land, of which is now Cherry Point Marine Base. My ancestors were not properly compensated. If America and California, I would say parenthetically, has done mean, unjust things to the Negro, it must organize and do good things with the Negro right. for the benefit of the Negro. Mm -hmm. End of the quote. That sounds like reparations. Yeah. Land equals freedom in so many ways. Uh, historically, land equal freedom in, in the sense that there was physical space, a separation between Black people and people who uh, oppress them. And then being able to use your own expertise to produce resources for your family and be economically independent, that created freedom. People really don't understand the importance of the Black farmer in the African-American experience. The Black churches were often on land that had been given by a Black farmer or the black schools were located on land that a black farmer had provided. So land is power. Most definitely. Land ownership is a crucial tool for wealth building and independence, both of which black Americans have struggled to attain since being transported to the U.S. against their will centuries ago. The total area of black owned farmland peaked over 100 years ago at 16 million acres but has since plummeted more than 70%, totaling an estimated loss of $326 billion. You speak yes. up, you know yes. what, you're just as powerful as anything else. Yes. In April 2022, a private railroad company sent letters to the Smiths and other residents of their predominantly black neighborhood asking to purchase some of their property. The company has plans to construct a railroad to transport building materials and timber. Around three quarters of a mile of track would cut through the middle of the Smiths family's property and would sit about 700 yards behind Mark and Janet's house. After the Smiths refused to sell, the company petitioned for eminent domain, a legal practice the government or a private utility can use to seize private citizens' land for just compensation if it's for the public good. The Sandersville Railroad Company claims that the railroad would annually generate at least $1.5 million for the county. You can see where the markers are and where the train came up through where it's to come this way right. and go across. We're on my nephew's property right now. Right. Where my nephew's is going to cross his and then it's going to cross my brother William's because he has three, three tracks here. He's going to go across all three of his pieces. Mm -hmm. In terms of distance, length, mm -hmm. what are we talking about here? It's pretty wide. It's pretty wide. And that's an issue, but that's not the only issue. What about your grandkids and kids and things? They come back here. You got a train, you know? What about people on the train? I mean, just all kinds of reasons we don't want it here. Environmental problem, noise. Mm, derailment. You know, derailment, fires. Right. You know, toxic waste. What about waste? What are you going to bring through here? You're going to be bringing any kind of chemicals? And then on top of that, all of this, the value of it, mm. it plummets. You know, it's not worth what it was. Our sons will inherit something with somebody else's name on it because it's, it's a forever. lifetime. It's forever. It's forever. We want to keep our property uh, clean and clear, just like it's been for the last 97 years with us. 
and we and and um and we're gonna fight to keep it that way. And I commit this day at the age of eight and two that I'm going to stay in this struggle until God calls me home. I'm going to stay in this struggle until justice rolls down like waters and there's an ever-flowing stream. I'm going to stay in this struggle until the day will come that because of the fight of this task force and the integrity of black folks who were the only ones to be enslaved in this nation, I'm going to stay in the struggle until America is redeemed. And the day will come when all of us will be able to say, I'm black and I'm proud. I feel that no one owes me anything. I serve a powerful God, a powerful Jesus. I've not suffered. In fact, I am humbled. And I've taught my sons the same thing. I said, God is the great equivocator. Uh, if you're looking over your shoulder and you're looking for something, you're not gonna find it and you're not gonna get it that way. Uh, you look ahead. I was born on April 8, 1968, in Hollywood, California. When I was born, my birth mother would not look at me, and she was relinquishing me for adoption. On August 18, 1968, my parents, Betty and Walter J. Porter, adopted me and took me home. I was raised in a stable environment with loving parents who were both educators and taught me to appreciate my black heritage. When I was eight years old, I was asked by a friend whose mother taught at the same school as my mom, are you adopted? I had no idea what um, adopted meant and did not know if I were adopted. So I asked my mom and she said, yes. I accepted the answer and eventually asked what adopted meant. I hired a researcher to help me locate my birth parents. Esther looked at me and apologize for the choices she made for my birth mother as she was 15 at the time and I was her second child. However, she told me that they were not proud of their racial attitude, but they made her give me up because I was black. I later met my um, birth mother. We have a strained relationship over the years. She later um, told me that my grandmother Esther said, we swept you under the rug and you should ha have been kept there. Number one, Francis Paulette, my paternal grandmother's great grandfather, Thomas B. Paulette, enslaved our family in Noxubi County, Mississippi. The plantation is preserved and is now named Circle M Plantation. A description of it is a magnificent southern plantation providing fine hunting and fishing, bed and breakfast, romantic getaways, and hosting of weddings in our lovely antebellum home. Mm. Since qualifications for reparations is going to be determined through lineage-based research, there needs to be legislative law changes to open sealed birth and adoption records. Thank you for this opportunity to, to tell our story, a, to, a story that had been erased and never presented in any history book, a story of two families, one family from Louisiana, another one from Oklahoma, one family landed in San Francisco, the other landed in West Oakland, where the government used eminent domain to snatch our land, and we then landed in Russell City. This is the city where I was born, Hayward, California, and where I was forced out through, again, eminent domain by policies and practices that have been put in place that would eliminate our communities. This was painful for my mother who sits here and I'm glad she's still here today to see this. Thank you, mom. 
We still to this day have street sweepers that roll through our city streets. I still live in that redlined area and do not clean up the dirt. So this still exists to this day. Not only that, those same communities were over police. I have two brothers who suffered from the cause of over policing and were placed in a jail that was purchased with money that the county used when they sold our land that they took from us to buy the land to build the jail they put my brothers in. Is this fair? No. I lived, my house that my mother bought, she purchased the house and was financed by Mason McDuffie who had a hand in writing the laws that said we could not live in white areas. So although my, both my parents worked and had good jobs, my mother was a nurse in the emergency department, my father worked for Alameda County, they wouldn't allow us to move in their communities. But they bought, they'd sold us a house for twice the price of what they were selling new houses for in a red line community. How did this affect us? It didn't do well. Although we struggled and we were able to maintain and we were resilient, was this fair? No, this was not. And it's still taking place to this day. What this task force is doing today is, is allowing our voices to be heard. I'm thankful for Artavia Berry who was help, helped to build, um, to write the apology from the city of Hayward. Just this week, we received an apology from Alameda County. Uh, we received an uh, apology from California Association of Realtors. But apology alone, as a standalone, is not enough. We need to be repaired, restored, and repaid for all the pain and suffering that we have endured. And we still stand here today as upright citizens of the United States of America. And we deserve to be treated just as well as any other community.